I was reading this biography recently on the mountain man, Jim Bridger, and a guy named Jim Kleiman kept popping up. And this isn't the first time I've ever read about Jim Kleiman. Seems like I've been seeing this guy's name mentioned in nearly every nonfiction book I've ever read on fur trappers and mountain men. And chances are, you've probably seen his name too. But who was he? Turns out there's a good reason this guy is mentioned in all those books on fur trappers. And now that I know more about the man, I'm astonished that Kleiman isn't as well known to me and you as the aforementioned Jim Bridger. Or Kit Carson. Or Hugh Glass. Or Jedediah Smith, for that matter. Because Jim Kleiman not only knew all of them, but he rode with them. He fought alongside them. And in some cases, he saved their damn lives. And those aren't the only historical figures with connections to Jim Kleiman. How's Abraham Lincoln and George Washington strike you? Go ahead and toss in Alexander Hamilton for good measure. And later on in life, Kleiman would have another rendezvous with historical destiny. One I guarantee you've heard of. Now, Jim may not have actually met George Washington, at least not that I can prove, but he was born and spent the first 15 years of his life on a farm that his family rented from our nation's first president. The Kleiman family, by the way, would later move to Ohio at a time when Ohio was still very much part of the frontier. And Jim, at the age of 20, joined the army as a ranger, fighting against the Shawnee in the War of 1812. Once hostilities ceased and not quite ready to settle down on the farm, Kleiman headed west to Illinois and took up several odd jobs, like harvester and woodcutter and hunter, and finally as a surveyor in the employee of Alexander Hamilton's son, William. Of course, this was after his daddy had that deadly duel with Burr. Aaron Burr, that is. Not Bill Burr. Still ever on the move, the year 1823 found a 31-year-old Jim Kleiman in St. Louis, just in time to join up with General Ashley and his 100 enterprising young men, headed up the river Missouri to trap and trade for beaver. Yes, this is that same bunch that included Hugh Glass, Jim Beckwith, Jim Bridger, Broken Hand Fitzpatrick, and that notorious river rat, Mike Fink. Speaking of Hugh Glass, you may remember a fight scene in that movie The Revenant where the party is attacked by hostiles and people are yelling, Get to the boat! That's a very artistic rendition of an actual real fight, one that I talk more in depth on in the episode I did on Hugh Glass. It occurred on the 2nd of June, 1823 in present-day Corson County, South Dakota. And it was a fight that nearly cost Jim Kleiman his life. He was one of the trappers stuck on shore when 15 of his own were slaughtered. Diving into the water head first under a hail of arrows, Kleiman, although wounded, was able to make it to safety, eventually. And yes, he was among the revenge party who came back to punish the Arikara, ineffective though they were, before abandoning the river and pushing inland. Now, Jim was not there when old Hugh Glass got mauled by that bear, although his written record of the incident, given to him secondhand, contains some very valuable information. And yes, I said written record. Amongst the mountain men, Kleiman was considered educated, meaning that he could read and write. A lot of what we know about these great men in the mountains, we learned from the journals of Jim Kleiman. And although he wasn't there, like I said, when Hugh Glass got attacked by that grizz, he was present shortly thereafter when Jed Smith got his mauling. Hell, it was Kleiman who sewed Smith's ear back on his head. Jim was with Broken Hand Fitzpatrick when they, air quotes, discovered the South Pass in 1824, and he was with Bridger in 25 when they paddled around the Great Salt Lake in search of the mysterious and non-existent Wayne of Ventura River. From the upper Missouri to the Rocky Mountains to the Great Salt Flats, Jim Kleiman was there. He saw the prairie covered in buffalo, the streams full of beaver, and the great tribes in all their pride and power and glory. And just like many of his contemporaries, like Hugh Glass and John Coulter, Kleiman was left afoot, alone and in hostile territory, hundreds of miles from civilization, with no choice but to walk out. Surviving off nothing but his wits, muscle, guts, and luck. Once even having to trade his scalp for his own life. Described by a friend as being of good character, straightforward, and upright, Jim Kleiman was, in the vernacular of the rough and randy fur trappers, a man to ride the river with. One of those rare breed who were born with the bark on. A very tough man amongst very tough men. But he knew when to get when the getting was good. Kleiman returned to St. Louis sometime in the late 1820s and sold his furs. Flush with cash, he would spend the next 16 or so years living in Illinois and Wisconsin. 
using some of his money to set his brothers up on a farm, some more to invest in a store and a sawmill, and using some of the profits from those ventures to do a little bit of land speculation. Ah, but trouble was afoot. The Sauk, Fox, and Kickapoo tribe soon took to the warpath under Chief Blackhawk, a bloody affair that saw hundreds dead before it was all said and done. Clyman did his part, joining the militia and serving alongside a tall, lanky youngster by the name of Abraham Lincoln. We didn't think much then about his ever being the President of the United States, Clyman once said of his former brother-in-arms turned diplomat. Following that dust-up, Jim did a little more scouting for the Army and a little more surveying before he finally tired of life back east and headed out towards the High Lonesome once again, sometime in the early to mid-1840s. And sure, Beaver was petered out by then, but a man of his particular skills could at least earn a living guiding wagon trains, both to Oregon and California, which is exactly what our Jim Kleiman was up to in 1846. Full disclosure, old Jim Kleiman was not only getting paid to guide these poor wayfaring strangers, but to also maybe influence them as to their destination of choice. A man by the name of Sutter had offered the old mountain man money to try to convince Oregon-bound pilgrims to give California a chance. You know the Oregon Trail, right? Starts over there in Independence, Missouri, and kind of snakes west along the Platte River, all through Nebraska and into Wyoming. Then further west, it crosses the divide at the South Pass. Yes, the same South Pass our Jim Kleiman helped rediscover. Then the trail cuts southwest to Fort Bridger in Wyoming before turning north up to Fort Hall in present-day Idaho. Then they would follow the Snake River and then the Columbia River, and then boom, they'd arrive at the Promised Land. Well, California-bound travelers followed that same path up to a point, and that point was usually Fort Hall. They'd leave there and swing south on the aptly named California Trail and continue south by southwest through Nevada before finally reaching Sutter's Fort, where Sacramento, California now stands. And like I said, Jim Kleiman was getting offered money to try to convince people to head to California instead of Oregon. And he was doing so with a clear conscience. He had made the trip several times himself. He had guided wagons over that trail. He knew it was doable. What was far less doable, and what Jim Kleiman would not recommend, was a proposed shortcut. Instead of leaving Fort Bridger in the southwest corner of Wyoming and just going up north into Idaho and then back south again, A man by the name of Hastings was promoting his trail, the shortcut, which went due west out of Fort Bridger, across the Wasatch Mountains, and then through the Great Salt Desert before finally linking up with the California Trail over Nevada Way. It was shorter, yeah, but it was a hell of a lot harder. And when everything was said and done, you didn't even save all that much time. The trail had been traversed before. Jim Kleiman himself had covered every inch of it. The only problem was it had never been covered in wagons and it weren't no path for a bunch of tenderfoot Easterners. Just the salt desert alone was once described by Jim Kleiman as, quote, the most desolate country, perhaps, on the entire globe, end quote. So as you can imagine, when Jim ran into an old militia friend of his from the Black Hawk War, a guy by the name of James Reed, in July of 1846, Jim urged the man to not take this shortcut, explaining that it was just too dangerous. Unfortunately, Reed, along with another guy named Donner, were resolute. They said that they and their party would try this Hastings shortcut anyway, against the experienced old trapper's advice. And you know what they say, man, a hard head makes a soft ass. That so-called shortcut ended up costing this Donner party a month's worth of travel on an already tight schedule. Caused them to wind up stranded in the Sierra Nevadas when the snow began to fly. And, well, you know what happened then. As for Jim Kleiman, he returned east to Wisconsin handled some business affairs, and then headed back to California yet again. By this time, I'm sure he would have probably heard about what happened to the ill-fated pilgrims who refused to take his advice, of the over 40 dead and the survivors who now knew the taste of human flesh, who knew the hell ain't always hot. Kleiman ended up putting down roots in Napa Valley, got himself hitched to a lady three decades his junior, had a whole passel of kids, finally passing away on December 27th, 1881 at 89 years of age. This veteran of the War of 1812 who trudged west into the great Rocky Mountains when Beaver was prime had somehow outlived that pup of an outlaw, Billy the Kid. And that's about all I've got on Jim Kleiman. I'm by no means an expert on the man. What you just heard was what little I've put together in, you know, just the last couple of days. I was actually working on a different story and I got sidetracked by Jim and I thought I'd share what I learned. 
If you're interested in more, uh, check out what the man himself wrote in his own journal. It is available on Amazon for a few bucks, and I know I'll be picking it up soon. Someone once asked me how many of these episodes I could possibly do. Like, there aren't that many people from the Wild West to talk about, right? Man, I got a list a mile long, and every new book or subject that I look into reveals a new interesting character, just like Jim Kleiman. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, truth is I just kind of used Jim Kleiman to sort of lure you in. Something we got to talk about, that 9,000-pound elf in the room. Why haven't I been putting out any new episodes? If you listened to my last episode, the one on Bill Longley, and if you made it to the very end, you probably remember me announcing the birth of my daughter. What I did not mention is that she was born very premature, weighing in at just barely over three pounds. Tiny little thing. Well, when babies are born so prematurely, they often have to spend time in the NICU. That's the intensive care unit for newborns. And that's where my baby girl spent the first 30 days of her life. She's doing amazing, by the way. She's home now, has absolutely no medical issues. Just a healthy, beautiful little baby girl. Only problem is, she still can't wipe her ass. And I can't understand a damn thing she says. <sighs> Nobody's perfect, I guess. So yeah, a newborn in the hospital is not fun. And what's also not fun is moving while you've got a newborn in the hospital. I shit you not. The plan was to be moved out of my old beat laboratory and into a new place and have everything settled by the time my daughter got here. But she had other plans. As you can imagine, the last two months have consisted of a lot of worrying and praying Trips to the hospital, and packing and unpacking boxes and putting together the furniture and blah, blah, blah. all that fun stuff. Tossed in some extra hours at work and I just did not have a whole lot of time to devote to podcasting. But I ain't forgot about you. I wanted to record this and put it out there. Just let you all know I'm still here. I'm still fat, I'm still sassy, and I'm still classy. And vanquish all doubt, the Wild West extravaganza will return. By the way, I'm not complaining at all. Uh, I know full well how blessed I am with my little girl being born so early. I mean, she didn't need to be put on oxygen. She didn't have any problems gaining weight. Nothing. Zero issues. Her time in the NICU was strictly for observation, you know, just in case. She did great and she continues to do amazing. So I am blessed beyond words. And that's the good news. Bad news is you might just have to wait a little bit longer for more episodes. Between the baby, the new place, extra hours, then there's the whole chaos that the upcoming holidays will surely bring. Don't call me Shirley. With all of that in mind, I have decided that the Wild West extravaganza that you know and love will return on Wednesday, January 5th, 2022. But Josh, that's almost three months away. I know. It'll be a long-ass hiatus once it's all said and done, but y'all gotta trust me on this. I got some good things planned. And this way, when I do come back, I'll have a couple episodes in reserve. Lock cocked and ready to blow all of his sticky, warm history goodness all over your eardrums. This way, there won't be any more delays or pauses going forward. Fresh episode every two weeks until this thing of ours runs its course. I'm going to take my time, do this the right way. No more amateur hour around these parts. And I assure you, I am not on no podcast vacation from now till January. I'm already working on several episodes, just tappity tap tapping on my little keyboard whenever I get a few spare hours. For those of you still supporting the podcast on Patreon, you're awesome. For those of you who were supporting on Patreon and stopped, you're also awesome. I said it a long time ago, anybody who can't keep subscribing on Patreon or who simply just don't want to, I don't blame you. $5 is $5 and you work hard for your money. So whether or not it was just for one month or if you're still supporting the Wild West extravaganza, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Still giving 20% of the proceeds from Patreon to charity, by the way. I haven't posted it yet, but last week was the most recent donation, and we gave to the Marine Corps Toys for Tots. Hopefully, at least a couple of kids will have a slightly merrier Christmas, thanks to you. And I do want to at least give something back to my patrons, or at least one of y'all. So here's what I'm going to do. I got this book called Dodge City, Wide Earp, Bat Masterson, and the Wickedest Town in the American West, written by Tom Clavin. The first person who sends me a message on Patreon with the word Dodge anywhere in the message is going to get this book for free. Start and rot me out. I'll get your info on there and mail it to you this week. And for all of you not supporting the podcast on Patreon, you will get a chance at a free book as well. Uh, Look for that announcement coming up soon. I just got to get all my books unpacked first. 
Also, a big thanks to all of you who emailed me just to see how I was doing or wishing me and the baby well. Your kind words are very much appreciated. Just because the podcast won't return as usual until January doesn't mean this is going to be the last time you're going to hear from me. Till then, I'm going to be popping up from time to time with a few short words. Um, I'd like to do a kind of a year in review sort of episode, and I'd like to do a little Q&A episode as well. So if you want to ask me a question or you just got something to say and you want to hear your voice on this here podcast, go over to my website, wildwestextra.com, and there's a big old button on the right-hand side that says, send voicemail. Click that bad boy and get to talking. The only thing that I ask is that you do try to keep it a little short because it doesn't record forever. You got anything longer to talk about or if you're just shy, hit that contact button and shoot me an email or email me directly at wildwestextra at gmail.com. If I get enough good questions or comments or whatever, uh, you'll definitely be seeing a listener edition episode of Wild West Extravaganza in the next couple of weeks. One last thing. Merchandise. I've been asked more than once, when is there going to be t-shirts and stuff like that available? Well, they are now available. If you go to my website, wildwestextra.com, go to the menu and click the store option. Or just go to wildwestextra.com forward slash store. There's a few different styles of t-shirts as well as a coffee mug. Got a disclaimer though. I've set this all up through uh, Printful and Shopify, so I don't actually have any of this merchandise myself. They handle all of the shipping and all that stuff. I just designed it. That said, I do not know what is or is not in stock. Still trying to figure all that out. I know with this whole global shipping crisis and all that, it's got everything wonky. Uh, I will say that I ordered the mug a couple of weeks ago and it came pretty fast. I'll also say that there are two separate mug sizes. So uh, if you got a man size thirst, make sure you opt for the 15 ounce. I accidentally got the 11 ounce and it's a little too small for my tastes. All right, man, that's about it. My old dumb ass got to go change the diaper now. Till the next time, keep your powder dry and your pecker wet. Adios. Adios.